Nagaro is a company. We are an engineering services company. And when we started our AI group, we, because of our natural disposition towards engineering, we looked at AI also as an engineering topic. And in some ways, it has been very advantageous to us. It has helped us become very naturally oriented towards MLOps. And we have, our, as a result, an opinionated view of what we think MLOps is. And that's what I'm going to share with you. Also, I want to share with you more about the practical experiences of deploying models and talking about MLOps with our customers. And I'm going to let not so much talk about the theory behind MLOps, which I am assuming a lot of you already know or probably can get in from other places. Um, so in, in our view of the world, uh, the key idea around this is that, you know, while machine learning engineers are obviously very interested in building awesome models, thinking about overfitting and underfitting, thinking about what kinds of inference uh, outcomes are they getting, how are they validating, and, and a lot of good stuff. In the end, it is also about just being able to engineer a complete product, engineer a complete solution with it. And so having this sort of a perspective where while machine learning is obviously really important, it needs to be packaged in an engineering mindset. And, and at Nagaro, this is what we've been practicing a lot what we've been trying to do a lot. Now, if I look at the kind of sample space of customers that we talk to typically, uh, and like you would assume about everything that is there in this world, the world is made up of many different uh, groups and competencies and maturity of customers, right? We get a chance to talk to customers with varied levels of maturity. They're customers which are very, at this point of time, data-driven. They're trying to work uh, a lot on their data infrastructure, on their data strategy, hoping that they would have the right kinds of data to build the right kinds of machine learning outcomes. Some companies obviously are have sort of sorted that out, or even if they have not sorted that out, they have definitely gotten onto the machine learning model bus. They're like building machine learning models. There's a lot of experimentation that's going on. And some of those companies are even more uh, maybe disposed off towards saying, okay, we have built a few. What we want is deploy it and get some outcomes. We see all of these three things. And there is no linear way to classify them. It's not like one is better than the other. It's just completely dependent on the uh, temperament, on the disposition, on the cultural setting, the kinds of exposures these companies have had. And, and this is our uh, sample set of you know, what I'm going to talk about. Now, a typical conversation uh, around machine learning productionization, typically, if we ever are in a situation like this, is basically has a few subtones or narratives. One of them is, uh, obviously, we want to use MLOps, and that's the reason we are talking to you. Uh, please do the best you can to help us in the MLOps area. Uh, the second is, uh, we want, obviously, to get these models in production as quickly as we can. Uh, this is obviously a narrative. You expect that to happen. And who wants to not talk about best practices? So these are all there in all these conversations. But if you look at the undertones of some of these topics, right? one of them is, when we are, when we are talking about please use MLOps engineering, Somebody's already made the choice of being in a certain environment. They have already said, okay, this is my cloud. This is my platform. These are the components I'm going to build my machine learning on. There are some assumptions there. And so that has to be a part of your story or your MLOps engineering story as you're building it. It's never made explicit, but we obviously are aware enough that it exists at some level. When, when we want to make models active in production, the subtext is, hey, listen, I want it as soon as yesterday. That's when I wanted it. Why are you, you know, talking about these things taking six months down the line? So it should happen like now, right? And obviously, best practices are really, really important, but money makes more, you know, cost is important. You, we can't do all of it. You have to be within the budgets and the economics of what it means, right? These are very important practical things to be aware of as you're designing these machine learning solutions. So... In our cases, right, we, we have to look at our world uh, of customers segmented into different groups. We do not see our customers, no two customers are the same, and every customer is unique from our perspective. And we have to have a paradigm, a framework, a design view where every customer can fit 
in some neat way for us to be able to help them achieve their productionizing goals. So what we have built is a, what looks like a complex workflow. Uh, a lot of this is, uh, uh, you know, what I'm trying to show you is the general idea of what we are trying to do. But basically what this is, is we have come up with a design framework that allows us to organize every unique customer in their context with the choices that they have made, with the dispositions they have, in the best possible way to achieve the most efficient outcome with MLOps that they can get. So, so that's what the, uh, the big idea is. When we, are, when we are talking a lot about these things, I wanted to also bring up some of the really difficult uh, and complex situations that we have to negotiate through when we are working with MLOps paradigm. So obviously data drift and model decay are two very important uh, ideas that practically every machine learning uh, uh, company or an organization has felt and discovered at some point of time in, or, or, or the other. Um, data drift, uh, the simple idea is that data changes and there are several reasons why it changes. Uh, but you start, no you don't notice it in the beginning, right? When you're deploying that machine learning problem. Don't even make that assumption. You have to wait, give it a few months, give it a few cycles, but very quickly after you deploy, that data is gonna change. And it just happens that, you know, the moment you cross the deployment scenario that you will find that such a situation has happened where the data is now not the same data set that you actually use when you got into production. Obviously, machine learning metrics and, and the KPIs that you're measuring measuring your you know, accuracies and precisions and recall, give it a few business cycles and you'll start seeing degradation there. So these are very obvious things. They happen in practically every machine learning deployment situation that there is. It's not like some models are more disposed to decay, some models are not predisposed, some situations are you know, where data drift will not happen, some situations, we just see it as a rule across the board, right? Uh, across all of them. Um, why, do, why do these things happen and, and what's the impact? So why do these things happen? You can get all the theory, but simply we live in a world that's changing. That's the simple answer. Every day is different from the day that's going to proceed, that preceded it, and every successful day is going to be different from the day that's today. It's just the nature of the world we live in. And so this is not even rocket science. You just have to know that your machine learning models are living in a reality where the reality is changing every day. So there's bound to be drift. There's bound to be decay. And you just have to think about this as a part of a way to think about it, right? In terms of what you build with it. Um, th those are the things uh, that, that, you know, that happen. Uh, in terms of how do we deal with it, there is, of course, a lot of science, but the simplest answer in our minds is keep tracking it. That's how you notice it. That's how you fix it, is because you're constantly tracking it. If you're, if you're thought that this is not important enough for you to track, then somewhere you're obviating this idea that, hey, listen, it doesn't matter. Um, most, most likely we'll be lucky and we'll not see something like this. I'm not describing, but I mean, you know, what, I, what I'm really trying to present is the, is the simpler way of looking at MLOps, which is understandable, which can be understood by each one of us. And, and it's built on the idea of simple engineering and not too complex uh, you know, uh, uh, analysis or so on. Another important problem is re reproducing situations. This is a very common situation we find ourselves in. Something happens in prototyping or something happens in environment A but doesn't happen in environment B. And that's a big problem. It can be a difference between what the machine learning engineer sees in their test environment or in their dev environments versus the DevOps engineer not being able to see that. And this conversation breaks because every Every um, uh, person uh, who is part of that team has their own preferential way of approaching a problem, their own preferential way of how they want their environments to look and how they like to work and so on. So this is very normal. Again, there's nothing wrong with having your preferences and having your environments, but at some point, not having a common platform of tools or not having a standard uh, around what tools one should use is a big uh, factor in, in such things breaking apart. What we do is basically, uh, you know, uh, really evangelize the idea of tool standardization. We'd say get on a tool, get everybody on that same tool, try and figure out if everybody can see 
those same things that others are seeing, this would help build a common platform for dialogue. So while people whine a lot and complain a lot, oh, our teams don't talk to each other, why would they? Because they don't have a common perspective and the org's not really orienting them on a common platform. So what you could do technologically is try and design a tooling standardization saying here are the three tools we want everybody to be on, it's okay, we understand preferences, but at the same time it's really important to have a common platform for conversation. Uh, something that we think fairly, uh, is fairly important for everybody to get, uh, to think about. So, so lots of things here. Uh, obviously, tool standardization is one important one. Tracking version control, it's a no-brainer. I guess nobody does without it anyways. Uh, testing, I mean, this is something we don't see very often, and we also have to get onto this practice, right? But you could have automated tests run every time such workflows get done, and that would also give people a common platform to think about. But, but making sure people are seeing the same things across uh, 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 you know, a set of uh, cross-functional, in, in a, in a cross-functional team is super important, super critical, according to us. Scaling, obviously, is a very important problem in itself. Uh, and and in, in this case, the big problem is, you know, when, when you're thinking of prototyping, you're just thinking of, hey, let's just get the work done as quickly as possible. Right now, today is the most important, we'll see tomorrow later. So the present is always greater than the future. This is, today is the most important, it's short term, quick turnarounds, getting things out, and then thinking about, okay, what the long term would look like. Again, very normal human traits. Um, this is just humanness in my mind, all of us are like that. The goal, again, in this case, is basically building pipelines or pipeline thinking. Uh, are you thinking of, and I'll give a, I'll try and bring a view if I have time about how we think about these pipelines, right? But if you have a way of thinking about pipelines when you're building machine learning, models or deploying or thinking about that, you will just find such scaling problems go away very, very quickly. So if you don't think pipelines and you just think about, oh, you know, I have to get, take a bunch of data set, a uh, bunch of data in a data set, train my model, uh, get some precision recall, show it to my boss and show it to my team and see, oh, all's done. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is like, okay, what does my training pipeline look like? What does my inference pipeline look like? What does my feature engineering pipeline look like? It's a vocabulary play, but it makes all the difference in how you approach an MLOps topic. <clears throat> the, a situation we were finding ourselves in very recently was and um, you know, was a situation where machine learning and data was these two topics that co often conversations happen be between, right? So you have the data team and you have the machine learning team, right? The interesting helplessness that we felt machine learning engineers begin to experience is that they feel like, oh, the data is not really in their control. The data is with the data team. And the data team obviously is like, oh, all the machine learning work is being done by the machine learning folks, right, kind of a situation. So it's, again, a fragmentation, a siloed situation. If you think about reality, what, what does reality look like? Machine learning is mostly done with features, really. We have to, at least, you know, before LLMs came about, right, where you could just throw data directly in and LLMs would do all the feature learning. I mean, most of the traditional analytical AI has been done with engineered features. And feature engineering is an important aspect, right? If you begin to notice that fact and make it more and more obvious, that, hey, listen, data and machine learning, there is something called features in between, and machine learning engineers are responsible for building these feature pipelines. And there's more control than they think they have about the data. They can take data, they can build features, and these features can be reused in several machine learning workflows. So are you thinking about those ideas at some level? So this sort of a helplessness and trying to take away that and making machine learning people more enabled, more empowered about a lot of what they do and use as raw materials for their models is actually in their control, is a very powerful paradigm shift in how you do machine learning. Something that we have learned over the years uh, working on these projects. So, um, I am not totally synchronized in the way I'm speed and talking and, and the decks I'm so showing, but, but you sort of get the idea here. The idea, again, you know, use a lot of feature uh, engineering tools and there are lots of them. Um, you know, Feast is pretty common, Tecton, and, and we use a lot, but again, our exposure is built on and, and 
and, and contextualize on the kinds of customers we work with and what their chosen platforms are. Obviously, we have an opinion, uh, and depending on what they, uh, if they like it, we share our best, uh, you know, the best opi opinions we have about these topics. So there's a whole bunch of technologies we work with, lots of different things that go on in a, in a MLOps paradigm. There are lots of different engineering approaches that are going on. So in terms of technology, I just described something. In terms of approaches, there are lots of different uh, approaches. There are several different best practices that are, have to be brought together. Again, these are all very commonsensical, uh, in, in my opinion, the way I try and look at it. But all of them are super critical in trying to get a MLOps story going in an organization. Uh, this is what I was trying to say that I'll try and show. A any production effort, and you can have a process view of that production effort or a project view of that production effort. This is a good uh, sort of a tool, a mental model of being able to take a deployment scenario and thinking about, okay, what am I suggesting for process and what am I suggesting for project? These sort of you know, ways of uh, looking at a production effort can go a long way in designing an MLOps workflow which can uh, succeed and, and, you know, can kind of give you the guarantees that uh, uh, machine learning ops uh, outcomes typically should be able to do. So that's one. Uh, again, training a model, uh, again, thinking pipelines or not thinking pipelines, that's the difference. So when you're just in the dev environment, the disposition is let's just get something done, think about precision recall. In the production environment, if you try and shift it, the idea is, hey, listen, are you thinking pipelines? Are you thinking about all of these things in the, in the way that it should be talk about, thought about? And you can take your teams and you can try and get the teams to think on in the way that you think is useful. In my mind, thinking pipelines is really, really important and very powerful. Finally, uh, once again, just a, a view of how we think about these problems. We, we feel that there are several pipelines in place. There are several complexities of MLOps. No MLOps project is of the same complexity. There are simple MLOps projects. There are medium MLOps projects in complexity, and there are super complex MLOps projects. A super MLOps complex project would be where you have 400 forecasting models being trained every week, being redesigned, deployed, and we have been in those situations. Uh, and then, you know, you try and manage all of that, not to mention the data sets that are coming in. You're also combining that with unstructured data sets in different ways. And so it can get super complex in the MLOps space. And you can have it very simple as well.